Hello everyone, and welcome back to another lesson on the history of the Monster Hunter series. This is part 4.5 in the series, and a continuation of the fourth generation of games. Today we'll be focusing on Monster Hunter Generations, and its ultimate expansion release. The Generations games, or Cross and Double Cross as they're known in Japan, really pushed the series and started to steer it towards Monster Hunter World. Some say this was for the better, while others say it was for the worse. The series began to expand on the high mobility of Monster Hunter 4 and evolved the concept with flashier movement, special attacks, monster designs, and concepts. Generations feels like a celebration of the Monster Hunter games. It contains many returning hunting areas, monsters, and even villages that the player will revisit. Characters throughout the series mark their return in a nostalgia-fueled hyper-action experience that really set the tone for the future of the series. Everything in Generations is bigger, better, and more customizable than before. The game even boasted four flagship monsters over the traditional one per entry. If you haven't watched my previous videos on the history of the series, I suggest you do so now. Additionally, if you enjoy these videos and want to help support the channel, please consider liking the video and subscribing. It just takes a couple of seconds and really helps boost the reach of the video to Monster Hunter fans everywhere. What led Monster Hunter to become the Capcom powerhouse it is today, and how did the series perform since its initial inception and release in 2004? In this multi-part video series, we'll take a look at all five generations of the Monster Hunter franchise, as well as Frontier, Monster Hunter Online, and several other spin-off games that have been developed. I'm Super Rad, and today I'm here to bring you a brief history of Monster Hunter Generations. Side note, just like the last two videos in this series, I'll be using footage strictly from the Ultimate version of Generations when talking about the initial release. Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate was a hit, selling well in both Japan and the West. This was good news for the series, and put more confidence in Capcom and the Monster Hunter developers when it came to localizing content. The game was released in Japan under the Cross title a year after 4 Ultimate's release, on November 28, 2015, but wouldn't reach the West until July 15, 2019, almost 8 months later. This means Western fans went about a year and a half without a new release in the series. Fans were definitely eager for new content, and generations more than delivered. Planning for Generations began during the development of Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, with the idea of the entry being the crossing of old elements of the series with those from newer releases. Hence why players get to explore old villages and meet pre-existing characters, some who have never appeared in a western release before. Ryozo Tsujimoto stated he wanted the game to have a festival feeling and treated the game as a celebration of over 10 years of Monster Hunter. The theming was designed around the number 4, meaning 4 hunting styles, 4 flagship monsters, and 4 villages. Shintaro Koji Jima compared the X in the title to a division of four sections. While Generations boasts one of, if not the largest amount of content within a Monster Hunter release, it is not considered a mainline release within the series. One of the community managers on Twitter confirmed this, stating Generations isn't mainline. This helps explain some of the experimental concepts designed for the game, like Deviants or Hunter Arts. This can also explain why the game's G release wasn't called G at all, but rather Double Cross in Japan. On top of all this, the game continued the tradition set by Monster Hunter 4, offering many entry-level tutorial quests to help familiarize the player with the content within the game. There were even tutorial quest lines for each of the weapons that were used to help players feel out what works best for them. Before getting into what was added, let's take a look at what was removed from Monster Hunter 4. Much like Monster Hunter 4, Generation skips the inclusion of underwater combat and continues to focus on verticality. Since multiple new maps mark the return, a lot of them have been adjusted with more ledges, allowing the player more options when it comes to jumping at a monster. On top of this, despite Gore and Shigaru Magala returning in this entry, the inclusion of frenzied monsters and the apex state were removed entirely. However, players could still get infected and it functioned virtually the same to Monster Hunter 4. Weapon honing or extreme forging was also removed, leading to less overall customizability when upgrading weapons. Finally, the concept of guild quests were removed as well. Players would now only have your typical quests available through the quest managers, as well as special permit quests for deviants. Mounting has also been updated. In my previous video, I explained how hunters attacking monsters would cause the player to fall off of the monster easier, but my reasoning was inaccurate. To clarify, monsters would still take damage from hunters when mounted. This meant monsters could also be staggered, which would automatically throw the mounted player off before they could topple the monster. Generally, hunters would ask other players not to attack when they mounted a monster. To fix this issue, Generations made it so monsters take no damage when attacked during the mounting process. Instead, players that attack the monster now directly contribute to helping topple it, meaning the action never stops just because a single player is mounting a monster. On top of not taking any damage, monsters also cannot be inflicted with status ailments. 
Finally, the threshold for mounting was greatened, making it more difficult to actually mount a monster. This was to avoid hunters hyper-focusing on mounting as a strategy within every hunt. As mentioned previously, no new weapon types were added to this entry in the series, and instead the overall functionality of each weapon was expanded upon through hunter arts and styles. Rather than adding new weapons to the series, the designers instead decided to focus on adding more freedom to the weapons that already existed. This led to the introduction of hunter styles and hunter arts. Upgrading was also overhauled in Generations. Now players would level up their weapons to increase their effectiveness. Certain weapons would have branching paths that were only unlocked when a player leveled up their weapon to a certain extent. However, generally the player had the choice to instead keep leveling their weapon if they didn't have the required materials for a new path. Higher level weapons could still be branched off later on if the player preferred. When leveling up weapons or armor, players would sometimes be required to offer up multiple materials of their choice from a specific monster. Each monster piece they offered would be worth a certain amount of points, and the player would have to offer a minimum amount of points to complete the upgrade. Rare monster drops would be worth more points. Now let's get into one of the main features of Generations, Hunting Styles and Hunter Arts. Arts are special moves the player can equip. The amount that they are able to equip depends on the style that they are currently using, and the types of arts available to them is dependent on the weapon they are using at the time. For example, Longsword users get access to the Critical Juncture ability, which puts them into a stance where, if attacked, they will perform a counterattack for a large amount of damage against the enemy. It's one of the strongest single hit moves in the game. When equipped, these abilities will appear on the hunter's UI while in a hunt. Through fighting, the hunter's gauges will fill up, allowing the use of these abilities when maxed out. After using an ability, the gauge will reset to empty. A lot of thought had to be put into the balance of these new features, as to not overpower the player and turn Monster Hunter into a generic hack and slash. The developers wanted players to still heavily rely on anticipating monsters' movements and behaviors, as well as reacting to telegraphed attacks. Hunting styles would dictate how the players would use their weapons. Generally, each style would have its own perks and restrictions, often limiting the moveset of the player, but offering them benefits in the form of more arts to use in battle or new moves entirely. First is the guild style, and one returning players would be most familiar with. This was your typical Monster Hunter control experience, but also allowed the user to have up to two hunter arts equipped at one time. Striker style is next and promotes a more aggressive and offensive playstyle. Players would have access to three hunter art slots, meaning they had plenty of moves under their belt, and their hunter art gauge would build up both through attacking and taking damage. In this style, hunters begin to lose access to some of their moves. For example, Dual Blades users wouldn't be able to enter their demon mode. The third inclusion is aerial style and would allow hunters of any weapon type to easily mount creatures. Players would only have access to one hunter art but could now leap when rolling. This leap would turn into a large vertical jump if the player rolls into a monster, allowing them to perform jumping attacks no matter where they are on the map. Insect Glaive specifically benefited from this style as it offered them more mobility and movement. The final form added was Adept Style, a style designed for veterans, where the focus is on dodging or blocking attacks at just the right time to open them up for a devastating counter. A perfect example would be the Hammer, which gets a quick charge after a successful dodge. Similar to Aerial Style, the player only has access to one hunting art. So what about the monsters? While Generations technically had the largest amount of monsters at the time, boasting 107 total, it only included 73 large monsters, which was two less than 4 Ultimate, but did see the return of the Leviathan species, which hadn't been seen since 3 Ultimate, including Lagaya Cruise. Let's take a look at what was added. First of the new inclusions is the Great Macau, a bird wyvern and an entry-level monster similar to that of Jaggies or Velocidromes. It has the ability to sit on its tail and use it as a spring to launch itself across the map. Malfestio, a bird wyvern that looks like an owl. On top of being able to inflict sleep, it can also inflict a new ailment to the series called Confusion, which will reverse the player's movement controls for a short period of time. It will automatically wear off when hit or when the player uses specific cleansing items. Next we have Gameth, the first of the Fated Four. It is one of the largest fang beasts ever seen and resembles a mammoth with a trunk and two giant tusks. It can use its trunk to suck in snow and even draw hunters towards it. Astalos, the second of the Fated Four and a flying wyvern. Despite its classification as a flying wyvern, its features heavily resemble that of an insect or neopteron. It has the ability to use electricity and will even lunge at the player one last time once defeated. Mizutsune, the third of the Fated Four and the newest inclusion of Leviathans within the series. It has the ability to inflict a new ailment, Bubble Blight, which has multiple levels of effectiveness. When first inflicted with Bubble Blight, players actually benefit from it and gain the effects of Evasion and Constitution plus one. However, if they are struck with another bubble attack, they will begin to slip and slide and lose the ability to attack. 
The final member of the Fated Four is Glavinus, a large T-Rex-style brute wyvern who has a giant blade for a tail. It can sharpen the tail with its teeth to create large explosions and can shoot fire projectiles from its mouth. Glavinus is also the only monster of the Fated Four to appear in Monster Hunter World within the Iceborne expansion. On top of the new large monster inclusions, there is one new Elder Dragon introduced to the series. Nakarkos is a large bone-covered monster similar to that of a cephalopod. It uses the bones to camouflage itself and can inflict a new ailment on the player called Mucus. When inflicted with Mucus, if the player rolls around in bones, they will stick to them and change the status to ossified. When ossified, the player's movement is impaired and they cannot attack. Including Nakarkos, there are technically only 7 new entries within the series. This is bolstered by the large amount of returning monsters as well as the introduction of the Deviant system. Deviants are special versions of monsters that come equipped with new abilities as well as new moves and fighting styles. Their appearance is different from that of their normal counterparts. Crafting Deviant equipment comes with multiple benefits. Deviant weapons help fill out the Hunter Gauge faster, and wearing full Deviant armor sets grants specialized Deviant abilities. However, simply wearing the full set isn't good enough, and the player will need to upgrade each piece to a certain level in order to unlock the set's ability. An example you can find on the wiki is Grimclaw Soul, which provides both speed eating plus two and high grade earplugs. Deviants can be fought through the use of special permits which the player can acquire over time by playing the game or through purchasing using their various research points. In generations, they can also be obtained through the 3DS's spot pass feature. Each deviant has 10 levels of quests that can be unlocked, and this number gets upgraded to 16 in generations generation's ultimate, although the G-rank specific deviants only have 6 levels. Players unlock these by hosting a deviant quest and completing it, thus unlocking the next stage in the deviant's development. This leads to better and increased rewards. Only the player that hosts the quest upgrades their deviant. This led to a culture of deviant turn online lobbies where hunters would take turns posting their deviant. Deviants introduced in generations include Red Helm Arzuros the largest of their species and colored in red fur. They can hurl debris at the player and jump to great heights before crashing down. Snow Baron Lugambi, a deviant with darker fur compared to its normal counterpart. They can lift large mounds of snow, similar to that of giant boulders, and throw them at hunters. Stonefist Termitar, who sports a larger left claw. The pincer is virtually invulnerable, but is able to be attacked when the monster has been tripped. Drill Tusk Tetsukabra, a deviant similar to a normal Tetsukabra, but with more pronounced and sharper tusks. It's highly aggressive and will often attack stunned hunters. Silverwind Nargakuga, true to its name, has silver-toned fur instead of the normal black coat. They are both faster and stronger than your typical Nargakuga, and often larger. Grimclaw Tigrex, a Tigrex which has developed large blue claws and has the ability to use Brute Tigrex's explosive roars at all times. Thunderlord Zenogre, a fully charged Zenogre by default that has a green shade around it instead of blue. When it charges further into its ultra-charged state, it glows a bright yellow, similar to Rajang. Crystalbeard Uragon, a deviant that grows large purple crystals in its giant chin. It can toss crystal-like rocks that emit sleep gas at hunters, but acts generally the same compared to a normal Uragon. Deadeye Yan Garuga. Not to be confused with Scarred Yan Garuga from earlier games, this variant only has one eye. It's actually smaller than your typical version of this monster. Dread Queen Rathian, generally larger than your typical Rathian and with a more potent poison tail that can inflict deadly poison on the player. Dread King Rathalos, a thicker and often larger version of your typical Rathalos that is also a deeper shade of red. These Rathalos can shoot fireballs that explode over time rather than disappearing or exploding immediately. And finally, Hellblade Glavinus, the only one of the Fated Four to have a deviant until Generations Ultimate. The horns and spikes on its body are larger and it looks permanently enraged, often fuming with heat. On top of this, it has the ability to inflict blast. On top of the new monsters and deviants is a final new form for monsters called the Hyperstate. This was a new state introduced into the series where seemingly regular monsters are now more powerful and aggressive. These monsters are covered in a black mist similar to Apex State. Despite this, they are not the same. This form changes up the behavior of the affected monster, with some moves becoming slower while others become faster, and their telegraphs change slightly. These monsters cannot be fatigued and will enter their rage state more frequently. They even have more health than your typical monster. Players can offset the difficulty slightly by attacking parts of the monster's body where the mist moves to. Doing so increases the the hunter arts gauge more than normal. Not every monster has a hyperstate, but generally all final forms of weapons and armor will require some sort of hyper material. Generation sees the players starting off in the village of Berna with all of the typical amenities you expect at this point in the series. However, the player will also find themselves traveling to three returning villages from past games to complete quests and gain reputation. These villages include Kokoto, 
Pokey, and Yakumo, various features unique to each of the towns return as well. In Kokoto, the player can pull out the hero's blade after successfully defeating the village quest Astalos. In Pokey, the player can access the Mystery Cave after defeating Gameth. Here, they can mine Dark Pieces and Dark Stones for the cost of Elder Dragon Bones. While Yakumo doesn't unlock anything for the player after defeating Mitsutsune, they can still interact with the Hot Springs and gain various requests from the NPCs there. While high rank quests exist within the Gathering Hub area near Burna, Generations does not include a high rank for village quests. Instead, it offers multiple quests within 6 star tagged as advanced and function as a limited amount of high rank optional solo content. Multiple hunting areas are brought back for the release of Generations. Some have even been remade, including Verdant Hills, a remake of Forest and Hills. Marshlands, a remake of Swamp, and Arctic Ridge, a remake of the Snowy Mountains area. On top of all the returning and remade hunting locations exists Wyvern's End, a special arena location where the player fights Nakarkos. One of the final additions in Generations comes in the form of playable felines. On top of hiring Palicos to perform various gathering tasks and hunting alongside the player, they can now also be designated as Prowlers and controlled by the player to complete various feline-only quests. The skills they use as Palicos can now be directly used by the player within these quests. As agile creatures, they do not have stamina and can climb and gather much faster than any hunter. Players can even mix and match their online party, participating as Prowlers in normal hunts alongside typical hunters. On top of this, there's a new minigame for sending out backup palicos on hunting quests. Now, players can choose a rank and shoot their palicos like pinballs into specific areas. Where they land determines what they'll bring back from a hunt. Generations was another successful release in the West, selling 4.3 million copies globally, even more than Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. The response of 4U and Generations in the West was overwhelming and led developers to wanting to focus more on localization early in development, and eventually release the games closer in date to their Japanese counterpart. We wouldn't see this for the Ultimate release, however, as it would be almost a year exactly after its Japanese release that it finally made it worldwide. Let's take a look at Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. To talk about Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, we need to talk about Monster Hunter Double Cross. All you really need to know is that Double Cross was a Japanese exclusive 3DS game which never saw a release globally. A bit odd considering how well the games were now performing outside of Japan. About 5 months after its release, Double Cross received an HD version on the Nintendo Switch. Japanese players could even freely transfer their cross data to Double Cross as to not lose progress and then transfer their 3DS data to the Switch and back whenever they liked. By this point, it didn't seem likely that global players would be receiving this entry in the series. This is because another 5 months after the release of the HD Switch title came the release of Monster Hunter World. A global release in fact, and one that rocked the Monster Hunter fandom and community due to its popularity and sales. Now, we'll get into that in part 5, but suffice to say, it seemed like World was the correct direction sales-wise for the series, and now seemed like there was little to no incentive to bring a pass game in the series, one not even considered to be mainline, over to the West. Well, get out the clown makeup if you felt this way because, surprisingly, the Switch version did finally make its way over as Generations Ultimate a year after its initial release. On top of this, Western Generations players could also transfer their Generations saves over to the Switch version so as to not lose progress. So what took so long? Why did they finally decide to release this entry in the series? In an interview on the official Monster Hunter YouTube channel, game producer Shintaro Kojima stated, The Monster Hunter production team were working on Monster Hunter World after the release of the Japanese Monster Hunter Double Cross. But there was a huge demand for a Western version, so we decided to bring it to the West. Meaning the push from a global audience really helped influence their decision on bringing the game over. Let's take a look at the additions within this expansion. One of the biggest generation specific changes was the inclusion of Hunter Styles. With Generations Ultimate came two new styles that the players could choose from. First is the Valor style, which is designed around a new sheathing mechanic and also locks multiple existing weapon moves behind it. Players now glow blue and sheathe their weapons much slower. This sheathing method can be lengthened by holding the sheath button, but will drain players' stamina and eventually player health. While in this stance, if players are attacked head-on, they will automatically dodge and immediately sheathe, while taking a percentage of the damage that they would have initially. This can even be used on Monster Roars, allowing the player to maximize DPS. On top of all of that, players could also attack out of this sheathing stance. Doing so would fill a gauge that, when full, will power up the attack of the player, as well as unlock various moves or introduce new ones entirely. This style only gets one Hunter Art slot. 
Next is Alchemy Style, which is designed around support and has three slots for hunter arts. Players can fill up their alchemy bar with up to five charges over time or through attacking. Charges can be spent to create support items that have various effects. A new large monster, Elder Dragon, and Deviants are introduced in this expansion. It also has the highest large and total monster count within the series, clocking in 93 large monsters and 129 total monsters. Let's take a look. First up is Valstrax, a new Elder Dragon and one of the two flagship monsters in Generations Ultimate. It shares similarities with a jet and can generate large bursts of dragon energy from its wings, which it can use to fly and propel itself at high speeds. Players focus on hunting Valstrax within the high rank village questline. Next, Atal Ka is the most recent Neopteron entry within the series and is the final hunt of the G rank questline. It's fought within its own special arena location and has the ability to grab hold of multiple large pieces of debris and wear them like armor, turning into a giant walking fortress. Those are the only two normal additions within this expansion. After these two come several new deviant entries that we'll go over now. First is Rust Razor Shianatar, which have sharper claws with more protruding spikes, similar in appearance to that of a Glavinus. It's no surprise then that it can actually wear a Glavinus skull as its shell. Nightcloak Malfestio is next and is another monster that has the ability to turn invisible. On top of this, it has golden scales and red webbing instead of the traditional blue color. The second flagship to ultimate is Bloodbath Diablos, an even more aggressive and powerful version. It is also much faster being able to turn incredibly quickly. Its skin is a darker tone similar to Black Diablos and has red vein-like streaks spread throughout. Finally, the remaining three of the Faded Four have now each received a deviant version. Bolt Reaver Astalos, similar to a typical Astalos but with larger features overall. It appears in the state of a fully charged Astalos, but can charge even further, changing the color of its electricity to blue. It can even generate a blade beam on top of its horn. Elder Frost Gameth, a deviant that can cover itself in a hard ice coating instead of snow like your typical Gameth. Even its trunk can be covered in ice. And Soulseer Mitsutsune, a larger deviant of Mitsutsune that is considered blind. However, it can open its left eye when enraged and will glow with a blue flame. <coughs> High rank quests were finally added to village quests which offered a new location for the players to explore called the Soratorium. Here, players would advance their village high rank quest line, researching and eventually hunting and slaying a Valstrax. While out on these quests, players can gather and collect burned husks, which can be used alongside research points to upgrade the lab facility within the Soratorium. This offers several benefits throughout the player's journey, but specifically unlocks the ability for the player to fuse armor. Armor fusion is new to Generations Ultimate and Monster Hunter in general. Now, pieces of armor can be visually overwritten with other pieces. This means players can now dress their hunters how they want. For example, if the player is wearing a specific combination of pieces to get certain armor skills to activate, but doesn't like the mismatched look, they can now fuse the armor and look how they prefer. Players must own both the piece they want to equip and the piece they want to fuse onto it. Another additional location, the Hunter's Pub is introduced. Another skyship where hunters can participate in G-Rank quests. This is also where the player will spend Hunter Coins obtained through G-Rank quests to buy fusion materials and various other goodies. Some more older areas marked the return in this entry, like Desert and Jungle from Monster Hunter Dose. But the only truly unique areas introduced were Ruined Pinnacle and Forlorn Citadel. Ruined Pinnacle is a full hunting area and where players will eventually slay Valstrax. It's only been recently explored and the architecture suggests an old civilization used to live there. Forlorn Citadel is a new arena location where the players hunt Atal Ka. It has multiple tools and weapons for the player to use, similar to most large-scale monster fights. Overall, Double Cross and Generations Ultimate sold noticeably worse than its original release, with only 3.6 million global sales in comparison to 4.3 million from Generations before it. Despite this, it scored fairly well on Metacritic, with an aggregate score of 80 from critics and 8.5 from users as of writing this. And with that marks the end of the fourth generation of the series. The titles Monster Hunter Cross and Generations are fairly fitting, considering these were effectively a send-off and celebration to the generations of games before it. Hopefully you learned a little something through watching this video, and if you've never played an old school Monster Hunter game before, I highly suggest trying this one out. It's incredibly inclusive and one of the easier games in the series to get into, with one of the highest monster rosters to date. These are long videos and require a lot of research. If for some reason there's an error, feel free to comment below and let me know. I always try to add corrections when I can. The next part of this history series will cover the current final generation of the mainline series of Monster Hunter games, specifically Monster Hunter World and Iceborne. 
though Iceborne may be its own video, depending on how long it ends up being. If you enjoyed this video and found it informative, consider supporting the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Again, it only takes a couple of seconds and helps support me in my goal of creating this content for you all. I try to respond to every comment I can, so if you want to hear from me, be sure to let me know. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.